Um, welcome to all of our participating speakers, Representative Macri and Rammel, Senator Trudeau will be here or is here. Uh, and we also have Michelle Thomas, who is from the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. And Shannon Corrick and Sari Adams, who are both uh, Washingtonians who are going to share their personal experience, um, experiencing rent gouging. And then when speakers are all through, we will be opening it up to questions. Um, as a reminder, please keep your microphones on mute when you're not speaking. Um, any other reminders? I think that's it. Okay. I will turn it over to Senator Trudeau, to get started. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here um, with all of you today and incredible house champions um, on these issues. Uh, you know, just a little bit about why I, I decided to uh, co-sponsor or, or excuse me, prime sponsor the bill, one of the bills in the Senate is because we know, I mean, every room that I've walked into, I don't care what political ideology you belong to. I don't care what uh, community you're a part of the increases in rent prices are absolutely just bonkers. I say that as a technical term. Um, I'll say that in committee, I, I've heard it from everywhere. And so this really, I think both of the pieces of legislation that Representative Rammel and Representative Mackey have uh, put forward and, and that I will have the opportunity to engage on in the Senate are just, they're, they're modest, intentional, appropriate responses to what we are hearing from constituents. So I'm just really, um, proud and honored to work with these amazing champions and everybody in this space to make sure that we're responding to what every person in every district across the state has been telling us, which is they cannot keep up. And we have to find out a way to cut off the pipeline of folks experiencing homelessness or put it, pushed into homelessness because they cannot continue to afford rents. So I think we've got a long, lot of support in the community for this and, and I'm excited to work on it in the Senate. Thank you so much. Next up, Rep. Macri. Thanks so much. Um, I'll say my my reasons are similar to Senator Trudeau's. This is not the first time that I've brought forward um, policies to address uh, the high cost of rents impacting my constituents and um, people across our state. Um, what's different this time is that um, as we and the legislature have engaged in um, passing policies to increase housing stability for renters over the last few years. I'm hearing more and more stories about how rent increases um, are being used to um, deny people of their rights. So um, back when I first started doing this policy making in my district, double digit rent increases, um, percentage rent increases were not uncommon. Um, but in the last year, I've talked to constituents in Eastern Washington, all across up and down the I-5 corridor, Puget Sound, um, about rent increases they have increased that are unimaginable to me, 50%, 70%, 100%, um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars a month. Um, we have an obligation as we work on the housing crisis um, there are many things that we need to do, but first and foremost, we need to make sure um, that people today can find some stability. And that's why I've been particularly focused on this this session. Thank you. Representative Rammel. Well, thank you. And, and I think you're going to hear very similar reasons for supporting this legislation from, from all three of us and from many of our colleagues um, in the legislature. Um, for me, I spent summer and fall uh, back in district talking uh, with folks in, in my community and heard over and over and over again uh, the experience of significant double digit uh, rent increases um, and the impacts those were having on families. Um, and I know all, many of us had similar experiences talking to uh, folks uh, across the state ex um, who are being impacted that way. I, I personally chose to um, prioritize uh, prime sponsoring this legislation on the doorstep of a young man uh, in Bellingham who was telling me about how he had just the prior month received a notification from his landlord that his rent was going to go up by $600. And he was in the process of packing to move and leave our community because of that experience. 
Um, and I think many of our colleagues have heard similar things, and that's why I have a lot of optimism uh, for this legislation's prospects. And I'm excited to be working uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, with Representative Macri and Senator Trudeau. Looking forward to this conversation. Thanks so much. Michelle Thomas with Low Income Housing Alliance. Hi, everyone. I'm going to actually show a PowerPoint presentation to provide some background. So as I load that, um, I want to share that I'm Michelle Thomas with the Housing Alliance. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy. You cannot see my screen, can you? Um, here we go. Um, and the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance is um, a nonprofit organization that's statewide. We work on state level policy with a vision of an equitable and racially just Washington where each and every one of us lives in a healthy, affordable home in a thriving community of our choice. We know that the public wants solutions to affordable housing and homelessness crisis. <laughs> any candidate, any volunteer who's knocked on doors this year has heard it loud and clear and the Housing Alliance has heard it loud and clear from our stakeholders across the state. No more nibbling around the edges. The legislature must pass bold, transformative solutions that will have immediate impacts and that will fundamentally solve Washington's affordable housing crisis. And that's what these bills will do. I'm going to show you a couple of slides that will help you understand the scope of the problem and why these bills are critical solutions that must be passed this year. So first of all, um, on your screen, who are the renters in Washington state? It's really important to understand that when we talk about protecting renters, we're talking about protecting black and other households of color who are twice as likely to be renters in Washington. So let me show my tech savvy by advancing the screen. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, so- Michelle, we're not able to see the slideshow. We're looking at a different program. Maybe your, <laughs> might be your Adobe reader. Oh, that's unfortunate. Let me try one more time. So did you not see the first slide either? Yeah, go back. We can see it now, but we did not see it before. Oh, you can see it now. Okay, great. So the first slide um, uh, was this one right here, that um, Washington renters by race and ethnicity in Washington state. Sorry about the technical problems. Okay. Please let me know if, if we run into any more, but you should be seeing Washington renters are cost burdened. Um, and this slide just shows that uh, many, many, many renters in Washington state are cost burdened, meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income on housing. And many others are severely cost burdened. And that means um, that they're paying more than 50% of their income on housing costs. I'm sure this won't be a surprise to anybody in Washington, but perhaps the scope of it will be a surprise. Um, in fact, 70% of extremely low-income uh, low renter households are extremely cost-burdened. So this slide is from the Washington State Department of Commerce, and it shows that homelessness and housing instability closely correlate with rent increases. They closely follow rent increases. There have been multiple studies over the past years that have shown this correlation. Um, and I think it's very important to understand this as we talk about the bills um, that we're here to discuss today. Also, average rents in Washington state are now $1,866. That is unsustainable for most renter households. And why does this matter? Well, obviously it matters to the hundreds of thousands of low-income renters, um, but it also impacts our entire state. When we have rents that are this out of reach across the state, uh, homelessness rises. The lack of affordable homes is the root cause of homelessness. There's other factors that contribute um, to housing insecurity and homelessness, but the lack of affordable homes is the fundamental problem. Um, also, when rents are this high and housing is out of reach for so many people in our society, not only does homelessness grow, but households can't afford to save a home. And many, many households, including fixed income seniors and people with disabilities and low income parents are being forced every day to make impossible choices between paying the rent or meeting their other basic needs like food, childcare, transportation, and medicine. We're also seeing this play out across the country with the growing workers' rights movements who um, have workers who are demanding that they get increased pay and benefits specifically to meet their soaring housing costs. The quotes on the slide are quotes from hundreds of people from, uh, from 
some of the hundreds of people we heard from um, from across the state who shared their experience of, of rent increases and told us that this is the number one priority of this legislative session. Um, and so this slide also shows um, that there is actually no correlation between rent increases or deep correlation between rent increases and inflation um, as is commonly misunderstood. Um, quickly, we'll talk more about this, but the definition of excessive rent increases under both bills is um, rent that is above this uh, this algorithm of between three and 7%. Um, landlords under the bills would be allowed to raise the rent more than 3%, uh, minimally by 3%, and they can raise it higher to match inflation, but it's capped at 7%. And we'll get into the exemptions, but the reason I wanted to point this one out now is because um, this chart shows what rents would look like in Washington if we had actually passed these policies in 2011. Um, and of course, this is for continued tenancies. Um, Rep. Macri and, and Representative Rammel will explain that neither of these bills have something called vacancy control. And so when tenants move out, landlords can reset the rent at whatever rate they want. Um, but for a continued tenancy, if somebody had been living in the same unit um, since 2011, um, their rents would be um, on average $400, $460 lower per month, which is a difference of over $5,500 per year. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. And in closing, just say, uh, you know, these bills are critically important. Unpredictable rent increases make planning for future housing costs impossible. Mortgage holders, in contrast, have certainty, but renters in Washington do not. And while rent stabilization policies and protections against gouging alone will not fully solve our housing crisis, it is arguably the only viable policy that can act at the speed and the scale needed, and it is a critical piece of the puzzle. Tenants need immediate relief in Washington, and these bills are necessary to uh, address the hardship that renter households are facing and to decrease homelessness. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Shannon and Sari. Uh, Shannon, would you like to start first and share your personal experience of how rent gouging has impacted you? I would love to. So for years I had a house with a yard where my husband had a garden and my grandson could play on his swing set and run in the grass. Throughout the pandemic, when so many people were falling behind on rent, mine was always paid in full and on time on my essential worker wages, which are not high. On May 29th, 2021, my mom and pop landlord sent us notice that our rent would be going up $300 on July 1st. We needed in less than 30 days to find and secure housing or face a 30% increase we could not afford and be locked into a 12 month lease at that price. If we had chosen a month to month option, the increase would have been a 50% increase. When we asked our landlord why, he said, that's what the market will bear. And it had nothing to do with property value and nothing to do with improvements to the property. He had just spoken to other landlords and they had decided that's what the market could bear. I've always rented from landlords with just a few properties and I feel they are more involved with their tenants, but he chose the rent to raise the rent on all of his properties because the market could bear it. And my family could not bear it and many families can't across Washington. We found one place and only because a coworker was vacating her apartment and I took over her lease, she was leaving that apartment because she was getting married and her husband's apartment was cheaper. When I first rented my home, the rents were much lower and increases justified, were justified and reasonable. A 30% increase with a month's notice is more than unreasonable. And what we found was that rents everywhere in Spokane and the West Plains were as just as high, if not higher. And so this left me with little options. So we got the apartment from my coworker and we had to borrow money to move into it because the costs of moving are very expensive, almost prohibitively so. For the rent I can afford now as an essential employee, I live in a small apartment with no yard or garden or a swing. I have not lived in an apartment since college 
Some of my belongings are in storage in a friend's garage. I live 50 yards from the train tracks and my grandson cannot play outside. My story isn't unique except for the fact that I got very lucky. Other tenants in the state who found themselves displaced have become unhoused and it's a problem across the state. I keep returning to my landlord's statement, that's what the market will bear. People cannot bear the hardship. People are losing their homes because just because you don't own the property doesn't mean it's not your home. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Shannon. Sorry. Well, my name's Sari Adams. I have lived in Washington, Washington for 20 years. I have lived in my apartment for 10 years. During COVID, my husband and I made our rent and our electricity on time every month in the full amount. Um, he was forced to retire due to a medical disability from military service. He served four years in the Persian Gulf and served 17 years National Guard. He makes $568 for disability. I make 707 for my disability. In December, our rent went from what was my rent? 976 to 1365. That's almost a $400 increase on a limited income family. The apartment complex that I live in has mostly limited income. Uh, we're a good 85% disabled, veteran disabled and retired elderly that are barely making enough to cover this new rent. Combined, our income is $1,275, rent is $1,365. We have been using my husband's thrift savings plan to pay for rent at this point, and my husband will be forced to go back to work after retiring 20 years at the airport for transportation security. Security administration. I believe we need these laws. We need these laws to keep people in their homes, keep people where they've lived for a long time. I love living in my small town. At this point, it's become unlivable for a lot of people. I recently found out at a city council meeting that our schools have 64% of the children on free or reduced breakfast and lunch. Seems that a lot of people in our state are on limited income and a lot of rents went up really fast, really high. Our complex is also expecting another rent increase of, I do believe my landlord said 8% come April. I was forced to sign a lease. I signed a letter had my landlord sign a letter stating that I could get out of my lease if at any point we can't make the rent without punishment. But that is not a law that's in effect. That was just something she was nice enough to give me, knowing that between our two incomes, unless my husband finds another job, we will not be able to stay here throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We're going to turn it over to Representative Macri and Ramble to discuss their bills in greater detail. Uh, thanks, Kristen. And thank you so much, Shannon and Sari, for sharing your experiences. Um, that is powerful and, and in some ways unbelievable. Um, it's clear I, we should um, all agree that we all need a place to call home. Um, it's a basic human need. Um, it also um, is essential for us to operate in community and have uh, adequate support from our communities. Um, but more and more, that's not the case. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the policy that I have proposed um, and also want to say um, before I do that Representative Ramel and I have been very uh, closely partnering on these policies. And some may ask, well, why are you um, introducing two different bills? Why not just one bill? Um, this is a big policy conversation for the legislature to have. Um, and 
while we know there is a pretty broad agreement on the problem, we have um, over 20 sponsors on these bills already. Um, they're on today's introduction sheet. What, for those of you who don't usually work Olympia Beat, that means that there's still um, opportunity for our colleagues to co-sponsor. We know that several have um, are planning to co-sponsor in addition to the folks who've already signed on. Um, so we know there's agreement on the problem, and we know that these um, policy proposals can be contentious at times, and we want to provide the legislature um, an opportunity to talk about a menu of options to address the challenges that many constituents in all of our districts um, are experiencing. And so that is part of why we have um, introduced two different bills. I'll talk a little bit about um, the approach that my bill takes and then pass it over to Rep Brammel to talk about his. Um, my bill is really centered around uh, predatory rent increases. It um, sets uh, a threshold of excessive rent, which Michelle described and glad to ask answer questions about that threshold. Um, over which um, rents uh, cannot be raised, except for in a, in a few exceptions that I'll talk about. Um, if the um, if that rent increase over the excessive amount is not justified by the costs to maintain the unit, um, is substantially likely to force a family or individual from their home, or um, can or is being used as a means to avoid other protections under the law. Um, you heard um, Shannon talk a bit about the difference her landlord offered in a term lease uh, versus a month to month. Uh, my bill would um, prohibit having a difference in the month to month versus term lease um, costs. This is in part because as we've um, passed a bill that I introduced a couple of years ago and put into law just cause um, protections for tenancies, uh, we have seen the um, pressure, hundreds of dollars differential in month to month versus, um, versus uh, term lease tenancies being offered by landlords, which create untenable situations for tenants. Um, and then um, my bill also limits the, the number of move-in fees, uh, the amount of move-in fees, uh, including security deposits, to um, equal one month's rent. We have seen a lot of pretty um, interesting um, creative ideas for new one-time non-refundable fees, including things like HVAC fee, like turn on the heat um, type things. Um, and so we are moving to prohibit these um, very creative fees that we have seen coming on. The other thing, um, I'll say there are some exemptions, um, certain kinds of government funded uh, affordable housing uh, for people with low incomes um, are exempted. And then newer buildings, so buildings that are 10 years old or less um, are exempted from the policy. Um, the other big thing my bill does is it um, puts both the Residential Landlord Tenant Act and the M Manufactured Mobile Home Landlord Tenant Act under the Consumer Protection Act, which allows the Attorney General to um, have an interest in protecting renters in our state much in the same way that they um, have an interest in protecting consumers who are subjected to predatory business practices. Um, the bill allows for the attorney general to invest investigate claims of predatory rent practices and then issue escalating um, penalties, um, starting with a cease and desist letter, but um, growing with penalties um, and also allows for the state to either for the state to sue a landlord in egregious cases um, and or for a, a renter to do the same. So that is the summary of my bill, as I said, really framed around predatory practices um, that are we are hearing more and more about and are and are harming tenants in our state. And with that, I'll turn over to Representative Rammel. Thank you, Reverend. Great. Um, and we'll echo your um, your thanks to 
uh, Sari and Shannon. Thank you for sharing uh, your stories. Um, I'm, I'm convinced uh, that the most effective thing we can do to understand um, that this crisis is to hear from individuals who, who are affected by the status quo and can really speak to the need uh, for change here. We'll also um, um, echo Rhett Macri's um, comments that these two bills approach the problem from different angles, but I think are not uh, in conflict uh, with each other. And would also add that I think these bills are not in conflict with some of the other important housing policy legislation that's uh, been introduced and moving forward in, in Olympia right now. Um, we, we need to do more than one thing uh, to address our housing crisis. We need to address the supply challenges. We need to be able to subsidize uh, housing for folks for whom the uh, market rate housing will, will probably never be an adequate solution. But we also have to stabilize uh, rents. Um, and we need to do all three of those things. I think those are not in conflict. I think they're complementary. Uh, so from, from a um, tenant's perspective, I think Rep. Macri's bill and uh, the bill that I've introduced, House Bill 1389, uh, that Senator Trudeau is carrying a companion of in the Senate. From a tenant's perspective, the impact will be, uh, for, for the most part, very similar. Landlords uh, will be allowed to raise rent uh, by a little bit, but by not a lot. So the, that formula that, um, that Michelle pointed to is the guiding principle in, in both of these pieces of legislation. 3% or inflation, whichever is higher, but never more than 7%. And uh, so under my legislation, it's um, modeled on and, and builds on the experience um, in, in Oregon, puts this requirement into the Landlord-Tenant Act um, for both um, home, uh, single family homes, apartments, uh, but also for manufactured housing. Um, so folks who own, own the house, but don't own the, the land uh, that it's sitting on um, and would cover them with those with similar protections. With that simple um, prohibition, uh, there are a number of exceptions that I think are really kind of the um, sort of the, the bulk of the content of uh, the bill. And so those exceptions uh, cover a couple of important circumstances. We, we exempted uh, new construction. We wanna make sure that we're um, not getting in the way of um, financing uh, for new builds because we know how much we need to build new homes, um, including new apartments in, in Washington state. Uh, we also exempted uh, publicly funded um, nonprofit housing uh, where there are already rent restrictions in place, whether that's based on the income of the tenant or based on the area median income. In those cases, uh, there's already protections for tenants built in, and so this would be duplicative. We'd, we've exempted those. Um, we also allow, um, under this legislation, would allow uh, landlords who make improvements to the property to raise rent by a little bit more. We definitely don't want to disincentivize um, not only maintenance, but uh, upgrades uh, to the housing stock. And then we also have uh, built in sort of a significant hardship in all other category, if you will, that allows landlords who, I, mean, I was thinking about um, folks up in Whatcom County where the labor market is even tighter than it might be even in, uh, in other places because of, um, because of flooding that's occurred. And so there's a lot of construction activity that's happening. And we, we wanted to have an exception for those kinds of unforeseen things where landlord might have trouble um, hiring people and might have to pay a lot more for that. So wanted to be able to sort of address any of those unforeseen uh, circumstances. And then the final exemption is, um, is intended to make sure that landlords who choose not to raise the rent one year don't feel sort of a penalty or uh, a barrier uh, that, or an incentive to, to always make the minimum, uh, to raise rent to the maximum that's allowed. So we allow landlords who choose not to raise rent one year um, to raise it by more than they otherwise would be allowed to in subsequent years. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of the legislation that, that I'm introducing. Um, I'm, excited to see what the um, what the housing committee um, looks at and they sort of put these two pieces of legislation uh, side by side um, hear from folks uh, in the community and across Washington as they do kind of a compare and contrast and move forward but ultimately to me the important thing isn't which of these two approaches um, is the one that comes out of committee the important thing to me is that everybody in Washington the state deserves a home 
and the status quo is not doing that adequately. And so we need a change and this gives us a couple of options for it. Looking forward to questions. Thank you all so much. I think we're ready to go ahead and open it up to questions. You can put it, raise your hand using the, um, the reactions bar at the bottom of Zoom, or you can put your question in the chat. Um, Josh Cohen, let me start with you, and then Heidi Hoover. Go ahead, Josh. Great, uh, Josh Cohen with Prescott. Um, the state ban on rent control seems to have pretty broad language prohibiting uh, the control of rent, and I would just love to hear from the representatives sort of how your bills fit within that uh, ban on rent control. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to take that. Thanks, Josh. Um, so the um, state statute currently prohibits uh, local jurisdictions from regulating on rent, right? That means the legislature and the governor um, if, if can put in a law in place, um, and that could change that. Um, neither of these bills end that preemption on local rent regulation. Instead, they aim to set statewide standards for, for um, all, uh, all properties under the RLTA and the MHLTA, the two um, governing statutes, um, with the exceptions that you heard about. If, if I could just add here, I, I, I really differentiate both of these policies from rent control. Um, rent control to me means that uh, landlord is allowed to charge a certain amount for rent, period. This is really when only either of these policies applies only in circumstances where there's an existing lease. Um, if that tenant moves out and a new tenant moves in, it resets um, to the market rate. And so this is just governing existing uh, existing leases. Thank you. Ready to go on to the next question, Heidi? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Representative Ramel, um, this language in the, about the hardship in your bill describes the disparity between the local costs for providing housing and the statewide costs. Is the idea there that the local market costs more to, to run, to operate as a landlord? So wouldn't that... Um, primarily affect expensive markets like Seattle, where people are dealing with the work, you know, the highest um, rents, the worst problem? It's, it's a good question. I, in, in writing that, I was, we were thinking about the, um, I was thinking about the, the specific circumstance in Whatcom County where labor for maintenance and uh, construction in Whatcom County right now is higher than it is even in other places because of flooding that's occurred and a lot of construction activity that's that's happening. So to some extent, uh, those those folks are will be will be covered under the um, the inflation rate. But where a local market is well beyond the inflation, uh, the, the costs are well beyond the inflation rate. We wanted to have an exemption that allowed for that. That said, in a place like, um, you know, in the, in the circumstances you're talking about in Seattle, um, those landlords would need to apply for that on a on a case by case basis and make that um you know make the case for the need for that exemption to apply in their circumstances. Okay, great. Uh Rebecca with KPBX next. Uh hello, I had a question about the um uh exemption for new construction. Is that all new construction in the future or is that like is this a sustainable forward looking like in 10 years, the exemption would no longer apply. Could you maybe explain that a little bit. Uh, yes, it's, it is, it is rolling. So a, a apartment or a house that was built within the last 10 years will be exempt and 10 years from now um, would not be, but one built five years from now would be built, uh, would be exempt uh, for 10 years after its construction. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Great, 
Melissa Santos with Axios, go ahead. Hi, um, I just was wondering, you know, there hasn't been a lot of appetite for limiting the amount that landlords can charge, or I, I feel like there hasn't been a lot of appetite in Olympia for actually limiting the amount that landlords can charge on rent these past few years, even as Oregon has adopted some sort of rent stabilization measures. What what do you think might be different this year with this bill? And how does this proposal compare maybe to what's different about this proposal maybe than some of the ones you, you all and other lawmakers have worked on in the past? Uh, thanks for that. Um, I would say that it does feel different this year. That's in part because we have seen these unprecedented um, increases in rent. I, I never thought that we would experience things like 100% rent increases where apartments in Spokane um, went from $700 a month to $1,400 a month. Um, but that ha is what we have been seeing, um, not only in more communities, but um, individually. So we really, um, we really looked at a policy that would kind of take that challenge head on. I think we've learned some from what other jurisdictions have done, including Oregon and California. Um, and both of these bills try to find a good balance. Um, we are um, interested in addressing this, what we see as the most immediate impact of our current housing crisis, but we know that these are just, are just certain approaches. Um, we need to be um, increasing the number of housing units that we have, the number of homes across the state, um, and we need to continue to have the state and, and um, other public uh, entities invest in housing for people who are going to always struggle to uh, find market rate housing, um, at least in the over the next uh, decade or longer as the housing costs are so out of reach for people on fixed incomes. Um, but uh, these bills really try to, as I say, strike the balance and really to, to limit egregious uh, rental practices. And um, Rep. Rammel can talk about the concept of banked capacity, which um, I think is an um, innovative thing. So there's a couple of innovative things in, in both of these policies. These, um, uh, this idea of, of really honing in on predatory practices and um, aligning our residential landlord tenant uh, laws with the Consumer Protection Act is a rent stabilization strategy that we have not seen in other states um, is really resonating with a lot of lawmakers. It just seems fair. And I think that is going to change the tenor of the conversation um, this session. And I'll turn it over to you, uh, Rep. Brown, will talk a little bit more about some of the innovative things in your bill. Sure. And I, I um... Happy to go into more detail on the on the bank capacity piece if if that's of interest. Um, but I, I will just say what I think is most um, most different this year compared to prior years, and that's my experience um, in going back to my district and talking to voters is very similar to what I've heard from so many of my colleagues. Um, and I'll I'll go out on a limb and say that any legislature who spent the summer and fall talking to voters um, in their community heard over and over and over stories uh, like Sari's and Shannon's. Um, and it's hard to hear those stories and not have a good answer. Um, and so to me, I uh, wanted to come back and have a good answer for how we can address um, those impacts on so many people in our communities. The problem has gotten worse, and so we need to respond. Thanks. Uh, Tim Gruber, you still have a question with the Washington Observer? Yes, uh, I was wondering if there is any consideration in writing these bills and providing any kind of uh, civil defense for tenants who inevitably may be dealing with landlords who are going to take them to court to get around these laws any way they can, and uh, the fact that tenants can least afford to be in court should it come to that. Uh, sorry, Tim, I think I lost the last part of your question, if you could ask that again. Oh, uh, was there any consideration about providing legal defense for tenants who may end up in court uh, because of landlords trying to get around uh, everything in these bills? Um, 
Yeah, well, I will say there are there's a couple other policies. Um, one that is in place is, as you probably know, Washington was one of the first uh, states in the country to enact a statewide right to counsel in eviction proceedings, um, and the and simultaneously the first state to fully fund that. So we can say with confidence that our low income um, tenants truly have a right to counsel. Um, council has been assigned to every eligible case so far um, for eligible tenants. Um, so in cases of eviction, um, th there is a uh, legal defense uh, that exists for tenants. There is a policy that was introduced last year that we anticipate will be reintroduced in the coming days um, that looks at um, a easier path to justice. Uh, for tenants, so some equity with the expedited path that landlords have in um, addressing tenant when the tenant violates the, the Landlord Tenant Act, um, there is going to be work on a uh, continued work on a policy for similar. Um, this um, the uh, these bills also allow for an affirmative defense um, for tenants if their landlords um, do uh, do levy excessive um, rents or engage in other predatory rent practices. Thank you. Did anyone else have anything to add, Michelle or anybody on that question, or should we move on? I mean, I would say adding the attorney general um, as an enforcement mechanism that your bill does rep Macri is absolutely critical as well. Um, and so that, it, and as you point out, Tim, in your question, low-income tenants um, really uh, would have a hard time um, competing against their landlord in court. Um, so without the expedited court process or a housing court um, that will be in the bill that rep Macri referenced, um, you know, it is it is a huge barrier. And so having an enforcement mechanism and enfor enforcement agency via the attorney general's office is absolutely critical. The attorney general's office actually used to enforce all of the state landlord tenant act. And that was removed um, due to a landlord lawsuit back in the 90s. And so this would um, provide the attorney general's office again, the opportunity to enforce um, the tenant protections um, and specifically the ones under Rep Macri's bill and also um, to um, use the Consumer Protection Act and the penalties within it to um, uh, add additional enforcement power and, and additional penalties. Thanks, Michelle. Andrew Engelson from Public Hall. Do you still have a question? I do, yeah. And actually, this is, uh, thank you. It's regarding the um, the uh, sort of banking of rent increases. So this is to Representative Rammel. Um, could you help explain how that works? It sounds like um, for landlords, if they don't raise their rent one year, they can save that rent increase and add it to this, you know, sort of quota. And I'm wondering how that works and if there are still caps on it, you know. So if in other, in other words, if a, rent, uh, a landlord you know, doesn't raise at 3%, uh, then next year they can raise at six. Can they get, go over that 7% limit? How, how does that um, how does that work? Thanks for asking the question. Um, I, I've got a tendency to, to go too deep into the weeds on policy and I've been trying to rein that in uh, in this in this discussion. So happy to happy to dig in a little bit here. So the, the way that, um, that that banked capacity program works is that if a landlord forgoes their opportunity in a 12 month period to raise the rent um, by that by that cap um, in the next year, at the, during that period, they send a notification to the tenant that says we're we're not raising your rent, but um, we are retaining the right to do this 3% in the future. And then in the, the subsequent year, they can raise the rent by what they would have been able to raise it by, so either 3% or inflation, plus the 3% that they've banked. Um, in the year after that, they're able to, if they choose not to raise rent again, uh, they can um, bank another 3%. The way the bill is drafted right now, um, there is not a limit to the number of years that a landlord could, could do that. They could do that for 10 years and raise it by um, by 30% in the 11th year. I'm open to hearing uh, that, you know, some other jurisdictions have that have similar mechanisms um, have limited it. Uh, I, I genuinely think that if, oh, if you're a tenant who's in that circumstance in that 10th year, you're still better off if your landlord doesn't raise your rent that year. Um, and so allowing them to continue to bank that capacity and giving them the incentive not to raise the rent again, 
is is still to the benefit of the tenants. But that's that's I've asked that question a few times. Um, it, it's maybe not intuitive, but I think it makes sense to me. Thank you. I see Heidi's hand up. Heidi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just uh, quickly, um, would is there any discussion about additional funding or staffing for the AG in order to enforce this if it were to pass? And then secondly, um, obviously we always hear from the landlords that the uh, legislation like this and the other policies that you've supported, Representative Macri, um, you know, will drive out uh, landlords out of business, will incentivize them to sell, um, that kind of thing. What is your response? Has, you know, has your response to that changed at all with this bill? Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Um, yeah, I've had a conversation with the attorney general's office. We're working on a, you know, the, they will work on a fiscal note. And so that will inform that, uh, what the costs will be there. The thing that I look to is the, you know, during the, um, COVID era eviction moratorium, the AG's office was um, tasked with enforcement of that emergency order. Um, and um, there were violations of that order from time to time to which the AG responded. I, I'm anticipating um, that that is a template that we could look to for um, what we might see if a policy um, like mine goes into effect. So yeah, I've been in discussion with them. I don't have any numbers at this point in terms of um, anticipated costs. Um, and then on the um, concerns from landlords. Yeah, uh, we are always trying to balance the impacts on tenants and on landlords. So you heard the really um, life harming impacts that increased rents are having on um, on tenants. Um, th these policies um, are intended to um, create stability for people in housing. They're not the only thing that we need to do to address the housing crisis. So um, we have been in conversation with the um, landlord associations um, about these bills. Um, they have in some cases given us some um, some good thoughtful feedback um, we know that um, you know that that landlords have not come running to us saying that they love these bills but so far they're willing to engage with us um, on the details which we very much appreciate and so as I said they're both both these policies are trying to take a balanced approach and we think there'll be ro robust conversation hopefully in both chambers. Um, that really digs into the details of um, the impacts, and especially if there are unintended impacts, um, we're really interesting, we're interested in um, unpeeling those and, and working to address them. So um, that is happening, but, um, but, the, but what the critique we often get is that these kinds of policies alone won't solve the housing crisis. Um, and we never have said that they will. They will increase stability for people who are currently renting. And that is an essential obligation that we have as representatives and policymakers in this state. Thank you. Unless there's any other response to that question, uh, we have a follow up from Josh Cohen. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, uh, sort of in, in the vein of the exemption for new construction, say a landlord buys an existing building and they are a new landlord of that building, would they be exempted from the policy or would it apply? If, if the building is more than 10 years old, the policy would apply. Any other questions from folks? Any of our speakers have any uh, final words? No, thanks so much. Sure. I'll, I'll just jump in and say, you know, I, I, again, what, what we should be doing as we're discussing these policies is not comparing uh, these to a perfect ideal, but to compare um, these policies to the status quo. Um, because if we protect the status quo, what we're doing is we're protecting people with power, with wealth, protecting investors and landlords over folks um, who are, you know, what we've heard over and over and over again, uh, people who are being driven by the status quo and these double digit 
rent increases. Folks are being driven into homelessness and many more are being driven out of our communities. Um, and so we, we need to figure out how we can help those folks and make sure that as we're, as we're contemplating uh, what we're going to do, we're not comparing it to, um, that, that we're comparing it to the status quo and the changes that we, we know need to happen. Thank you all so much. Thank you to, especially to Shannon and Sari for participating and sharing your experience and to Rep Macri and Rammel um, and to the Housing Alliance and for reporters looking for more background on these bills and other measures on rent stabilization. Just get in touch with, um, with Michelle at the Housing Alliance or myself and we can get that to you. Thank you all so much.